Well, good morning, Woodland Church. How are we doing? All seven of you are doing good? Okay, how are we doing? Okay, it's good to be with you. Uh, those that are new here, or maybe this has been home for a little while, welcome home, what Noel said so wonderfully. And for those watching online, welcome home to you as well. Wherever you're watching from, it's good to have you. Uh, I always say, grab and drag, legally. Grab and drag anybody, family and friends, and come here and worship alongside of us one Sunday. We meet here at 11 o'clock and want to worship alongside of you. That would just be wonderful. For those that are wondering, who is this guy? Uh, I was here just a couple of months ago. My name's Devin. I have the opportunity to partner with my wife as we pastor the Marshall Campus. And um, I said... I said last time, and I'll say it again, it's good to be home. It's good to be home. Uh, my wife and I want to thank you for always keeping your doors open to us. It's always good to come home and be with you every once in a while. I'm ready to get right into it. Anybody else ready to get right into it? Before we do so, we're going to go ahead and jump to the Lord in prayer. We need his help, and we need it badly. Isn't it cool that you're here? Oh, come on now. You could have been anywhere. I bet you the enemy tried to get somebody to stay home this weekend. It's nice. Enjoy one of the last summer weekends you can. You don't need church, but you're here. And I believe the Lord's here to meet us as well. You see, you can be here. Or you can be here and listening. And as young Samuel said that one evening in the Old Testament, he said, speak, Lord, for thine servant is what? Listening. Let's go to the Lord now and let him know that we're listening. Father, here we are now. First and foremost, we as a church, we thank you for the new mercy, the new grace that you extended our way this morning. The fact that you press, placed breath in our lungs this morning and then brought us here to learn from your word, to worship you. And we as a church, we believe in the truth and the authority of your word. And we ask, as scripture says, that you would teach us, you would correct us, you would rebuke us, and you would train us through this word. And Father, as for me, the communicator of this word, I am an imperfect man myself, a sinful man myself, the best to present a perfect gospel. My Lord and my Father, would you place your hand upon me in front of all these people? I'll say words, you preach the message. And this morning, we'd like to conclude by just telling you that we love you. Why don't you just take a moment and let the Lord know that you love him? Did you tell him at all this week? Or did you only ask things of him? Have you told him yet this morning? Why don't you just take the opportunity and just let him know that you love him? Father, we love you. We love you. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Everybody said, amen. Did you bring your Bibles with you this morning? I hope that you did. If you did, go ahead and turn them open to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, those online, wherever you're watching from, run to the other room and grab a Bible if you have to. Grab it out of the attic, out of the basement, dust, dust it off, whatever you have to do. Grab the Bible, turn it to the book of Acts, the second chapter. If you're unfamiliar with the scriptures, that's in the New Testament. You have the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Then you have the book of Acts and then Romans. So if you're in Romans, turn back a little bit. The book of Acts, the second chapter. And we do something in Marshall I'm going to ask you to do here. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? Those online, wherever you're watching from, go ahead and stand with me, with us, for the reading of God's word this morning. Acts chapter 2. The apostle Peter has just presented the good news of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus, for the first time here in Acts chapter 2. And the Holy Spirit used the words of Peter to 
penetrate and pierce the hearts of those that are listening. And when the people that heard the good news of Jesus, when they heard this, they were so moved by it. As the scriptures would say, the Holy Spirit uh, removed the veil before their eyes. They saw the hope and the glory of Jesus Christ in such a way that they asked, well, now what do we do? Because did you know the name of Jesus forces you to make a decision? And here in Acts chapter 2, he presents who Jesus is, and the people are so cut to the heart by it, they ask, well, what should we do about this? And what we're about to read here in Acts chapter 2, let me draw your eyes to verse 38. Here's how Peter replies, Acts 2, 38. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. Did you come into church today thinking you were out of the reach of God? My brother, my sister, you may have taken a thousand steps away from God. It only takes one to come back. For those that are far, for those that are near, and for those that are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Verse 40. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves, everybody say save yourselves, from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Look at verse 42. They devoted, everybody say devoted. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer, they devoted themselves. They devoted themselves. They devoted themselves. I'm here to share a message with you this morning that I've given the title, I'm in the middle. I'm in the middle. Before you take a seat, introverts, turn to five people, give them a high five and tell them you're in the middle. Give them a high five and tell them you're in the middle. Five people. Those online, we see you, you're in the middle. It's good to be with you this morning. I'm in the middle. I'm in the middle. I'm in the middle. Sit down. You're taking too much time from me preaching. I'm in the middle. <laughs> Goodness, this guy's harsh, man. What in the world? I'm in the middle. I'm in the middle. Acts uh, chapter 2. You and I uh, are going to, we as a church, are going to begin a new series this morning that we've given the title, The Art of Being Unordinary. And when I received the invitation to come uh, and kick off the series for us, I didn't know how to receive the invitation, to be honest. Hey, Devin, we're going to kick off a series about being unordinary. Why don't you come and do that for me? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Maybe it's because I'm one of the unordinary few that uh, still pray for and watch the Detroit Lions. I'm unordinary. I'm unordinary. Maybe I'm one of the unordinary few that don't only pray for and watch the Detroit Lions, but I'm one of the unordinary few that at the beginning of every year, no matter how the team looks, I say, this is our year. And in Jesus' name, this is our year, you know? I'm unordinary. I'm one... <laughs> I'm one of the unordinary few that believe that if Jesus were here in the flesh today, he would be wearing green and white, not the amazing blue. I'm unordinary. <laughs> what was that? Somebody said, send him back to Marshall. You know, he is unordinary. <laughs> I'm unordinary. I want to live an unordinary life, though. What about you? You see, I've... <clears throat> had the opportunity, the privilege, unfortunately and fortunately, over my years of ministry, not many of them, but over my years of ministry, to sit with a great amount of family and friends that have recently lost a loved one. This is my pre-funeral meeting that I'll do with family and friends. And, and every meeting really looks the same. I'll ask pretty much just about the same questions. And Every question pretty much points towards the same area. I ask the family and friends of the deceased, I tell them, or I ask them, tell me about their middle. 
You know that dash that separates the year they were born from the year they deceased. Tell, tell me about that middle. I, I want to learn about that. And, and I've learned uh, over my years of, of ministry this truth, and I think I'm still learning it. Unordinary lives leave an impact that ordinary lives only wish they could. I've learned it, and I'm still learning it. Unordinary lives leave an impact. Anybody want to leave an impact in our world today? Leave an impact in your family? Leave an impact in your friends? Leave an impact in your workplace? Leave an impact in our culture? Unordinary lives leave an impact that ordinary lives only wish they could. I'm learning it. I've learned that truth, and I've learned this as well, and I'm still learning it. There's really one thing that separates an unordinary life from an ordinary life. Watch this. Intentionality. What I've seen and what I've learned is unordinary people live intentional lives. Compare it to a piece of art, the Mona Lisa. It's an art. Did you know that the Mona Lisa, it took 16 years to complete? Why? Well, because every stroke was intentional. Every color was intentional. Every dot was intentional. Every angle was intentional. Every look was intentional. Every detail was intentional. And in the same way, you, I'm sure, I know myself, I want to live an intentional life that leads to an unordinary life that leaves an impact. Amen? What do I mean by that? Well, here's what I mean. Instead of just telling you, hey, I'll pray for you, what if I just prayed for you? Intentional, unordinary. What about when the world tells you to walk this way, to talk this way, to act this way, to believe in this thing, instead of going along with it, you said, no thanks, I'm going to walk the way this tells me to walk. And I'm going to talk the way this tells me to talk. I'm going to act the way this tells me to act. And I'm going to believe in what this tells me to believe in. Yeah. Unordinary. Whoop. Intentional. What if when you're in a conversation with family and friends and they're talking about, oh my goodness, our world, that there's no hope, there's no hope in our world, instead of just sitting back in silence, you actually stood up, spoke up, and said there is hope and his name's Jesus Christ. And he can change your life right now. And trust me, I have hope that he's going to come back. And all the death you see, all the disease you see, all the dying you see, all the tears you see, those will be gone in Jesus' name. Unordinary. Unordinary, but intentional. What if when the enemy, Satan himself, tells you that you're defeated, that you yourself, you have no hope, that he's got you. What if instead of falling to your knees in defeat, you fell to your knees in victory in Jesus' name? And you looked back at him and you said, no, you don't have me and I'm not defeated. I have victory in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm not yours, I'm his. Hallelujah. <laughs> unordinary, intentional. I want to be unordinary. What about you? I want to be unordinary. I want to be an ordinary, and here's what I'm learning. We're all in the middle, aren't we? We're all in the middle. Every person in here has breath in their lungs. Praise Jesus. We're all in the middle, aren't we? We're living out that dash. And here's the sobering reality, not just for you, but for me too. Last time I checked, the death rate is 100%. Just is. <laughs> My goodness, this dude's a Michigan State fan, and he's talking about dying? What in the world, you know? <laughs> Here's the sobering reality. There's going to be a day when a pastor, just like myself, is going to sit with your family and your friends, 
and my family and my friends, and they're going to ask your family and your friends and my family and my friends, tell me about their middle. We're all in the middle right now. And here's what I've learned by all the meetings that I do and the funerals that I've done. There's only two. There's a broad range, but really when you boil them down, there's two. A picture's going to come up on the screen. And believe me, the picture on the screen, I put my birth year because I didn't want to scare anybody in here. My initial one was I was going to put a birth year and then a death date, but I didn't want somebody to walk out like, yep, that's it. The pastor said it. That's the year I'm going. You know? <laughs> so I put my birth year. Go ahead and bring the photo up on the screen for me here. Two options. When that pastor sits with your family and your friends, he will one day. Two ways that I've been able to define it that I've seen. People will define your life by this through a multitude of stories and words. They lived a passive life. They just went through the motions. Or people will explain your life as they lived an intentional life that led towards an unordinary life that left an impact that the ordinary lives only wish that they could. We're all in the middle, and there's going to be a day that a pastor sits with our family and our friends, and they're going to ask about our middle, and you may be in church today, and you're like, okay, I'm convinced. I want to live an unordinary life. Tell me how to live an unordinary life. Woo. You came to the right series, my friend. And I'm going to be in Marshall watching every week after this because I want to learn how to live an unordinary life in Jesus' name. How do we live an unordinary life? Okay, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what we're going to do. Let me draw your attention back to Acts chapter 2. I'm going to lay a foundation this morning for an unordinary life. And I believe the best way to do that is by looking at the foundation or the early Christians or the early church, hence Acts Chapter 2. And let me draw your attention back to verse 40, if I may. Peter gives a great charge, a great charge. He says this, with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. That word corrupt there, it's simply translated decaying. So save yourselves from this decaying generation is what Peter is saying here. And I suppose that's just an ordinary life, isn't it? Just the slow decay. And Peter is saying, save yourselves from this corrupt, this decaying generation. How do you save yourself? By as the world slowly dies, you can experience life in Jesus. <laughs> save yourselves. Peter is pleading with them. And, and, and warning them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Experience the life as the rest of the world decays. You can, say, you can be saved in Jesus' name. Peter gives this great charge. And for those that did save themselves or were saved through Jesus' name, we look just at the next couple of verses and we see that they devoted themselves the word there, devoted, is simply translated to give all of oneself or to self-sacrifice. So they experienced life of Jesus, and in turn, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Okay, simply put, let me summarize it. You want to live an unordinary life? Here you go. Read the Bible more, meet with your brothers and sisters in Christ more, and pray more. You're welcome. That's all I've got in my notes. <laughs> what if I ended up? Somebody's like, really, Pastor? <laughs> You're telling me I need to read my Bible more, pray more, meet with other people more? Thanks. I came into church knowing that, you know? <laughs> oh, did I forget to mention that their devotion to Christ was a byproduct of their experience with Christ? Somebody missed it. Did I forget to mention that their devotion to Christ, the reason that they were able to give it all up, self-sacrifice, turn away from their own ways and devote themselves to Jesus Christ, did, did, I, did I fail to mention that their devotion to Christ was the byproduct 
of their experience with Jesus Christ? Because what just happened right before they devoted themselves, Peter just proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ, and you saw it, it cut them to the heart in such a way, the Holy Spirit moved on their mind and in their heart in such a way that they recognized that Jesus Christ is truly life, and they were penetrated in such a way that they were willing to turn away from everything else to have more of Jesus Christ. They devoted themselves, they gave it all up because they wanted more of Jesus Christ. It didn't take a pastor to motivate them. No amen there, all right? It didn't take somebody to push them, to challenge them. They saw Jesus in such a way, they, like Job said, I want more of him more than I want the very breath in my lungs. I want him. Get this or we missed the whole series. Here it is. Get this or we missed the whole series. How do I live an unordinary life? Here it is. Unordinary starts when the ordinary meets the supernatural. <laughs> Unordinary starts when the ordinary meet the supernatural. Oh, my friend, the supernatural's in the room. <laughs> If I were you, I'd sit up a little bit more straight. I'd listen a little bit closer. If you want to live an ordinary life, listen to me now. It starts when the ordinary meet the supernatural. See, I could tell you all day, devote yourselves to reading the scriptures, devote yourself to fellowship, devote yourself to prayer. Watch this. You meet Jesus in such a way, I, you won't even need me to motivate you. You want more of him in such a way that you'll devour your scriptures. You'll get with people because you want to see Jesus through other people. You'll get on your knees in prayer. Why? Because that's a way to, con to converse with your heavenly father. You wouldn't need anybody if you met Jesus in such a way. You'd be cut to the heart so much, you would throw aside everything and devote yourselves to a little bit more of him. Watch this. Did you know this tracks through some of your most, your most popular Bible characters? This theme, an ordinary starting when the ordinary meets the supernatural. It tracks through some of, your most, some, some of your favorite Bible characters. Let's look at Abraham. Abraham was willing to pick up everything, his family and his possessions, and move to a country that he had knew nothing, absolutely nothing about and was willing to sacrifice his own child. Why? Because of an experience that he had with God in Genesis chapter 12 that left him saying, I may not know what tomorrow looks like and I may not know where I'm going, but if I can follow you, I'm all in. You see it right there in Moses. You see it in Moses, right? Right? He was willing to go against Pharaoh, even though he had a speech impediment. Be why? Because of an experience that he had with God right there at the burning bush that left him in such a way, saying, I may not have it all, but if you're the God that's going to go before me, I'm following. Hallelujah. You see it in Isaiah. He was willing to boldly proclaim the coming of, the coming of a Messiah to a very wayward, uh, a, a rebellious people. Why? Because of an experience that he had with God in Isaiah chapter 6, where he saw the throne room of God filled with the glory of God. Then as the, as the angels cried out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, watch this. It wasn't just the foundations of the throne room that shook. You know what else shook? His knees shook to the point that he fell onto, onto his knees and said, woe is me, I'm just a sinner. But then what did he say afterwards? Send me. And there he goes and proclaims the coming of a Messiah to a very wayward, backward, rebellious people. You also see it in, 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 um, in uh, uh, who was I about to say? Oh, Jonah. That's right. Jonah. Jonah goes and preaches repentance to a, watch this, dangerous Nineveh. Why? Because an experience that he had with God in the belly of that fish that opened his eyes in such a way and convicted him in such a way and spit him out in such a way that he went and pr uh, preached repentance with great boldness and courage to a, to a very dangerous Nineveh. You fast forward just a little bit more and you see it in all the disciples, don't you? They're willing to throw aside everything, stop careers, leave families to follow Jesus. Why? Because it was God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, that they saw that they were able to say no to absolutely everything and devote themselves to Jesus. Then you see it in Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Look at what Acts chapter 4 verse 13 says. It says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with who? Jesus. I, want to be an, I just want to be an ordinary person that does unordinary things so that when I'm gone 
and God takes me home, people can say, we knew that man was with Jesus. I wonder if people would say that about your life right now. I wonder if I were to go ask some of the closest to you, people would give me the report, these people, yes, him, her, they walk with Jesus. I wanna be unordinary. I do, I wanna be unordinary. People ask me all the time, Devin, why do you do what you do? Why do you do, why do, you do what you do? Here's why I do what I do. I could take you back to the Brooklyn apartment as I was at the foot of my bed when I fell to my knees weeping and I wet the pages of Romans chapter eight with my tears because I learned for the very first time that I, while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me and that there was absolutely nothing that could separate, separate me from the love of God. Why do I do what I do? Well, I could tell you about a time I was in Harlem and it was at nighttime and I was sitting across this table, my devotional table with this woman and I tell her what I experienced in Romans chapter eight, that God loved me and he said, sent his son for me even while I was sinner and there's nothing that could separate me from his love and I saw this woman sitting right across from me I saw the Holy Spirit remove the veil before her eyes and she saw the hope and the glory that's in Jesus Christ and she begins to weep and she accepts Jesus for the very first time look at this no microphone no lights no stage just a broken man sharing with a broken woman that Jesus Christ can save her why do I do what I do why do I do what I do? Well, I could take you back to those stairs right there where that gentleman in the orange sitting right there where I held hands with my wife and we felt the Lord speak to our hearts, both of us. We heard it very clearly. My children, this is your home. Why do I do what I do? I could take you back to the time I drove off of Capitol Avenue, pulled off. I felt the Lord inviting me just for a moment. I pulled my car off Capitol Avenue, just side of the road. I turned the car off. I turned the music off. I just got done with the leadership meeting in Marshall where I felt overwhelmed, I felt unqualified. And I felt the Lord pull me off, so I pulled it off, shut everything off, and right there I experienced a peace that I couldn't even tell you that left me to sing, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. I could take you back to a couple Fridays ago as a couple of group of the men from our church was fasting and I was leaving our church at 10 p.m. on a Friday evening. I was finishing some stuff up and I went to pull my car to the parking lot and I felt the Lord say, put your car in park again. I guess God doesn't want me to drive is what I'm learning. <laughs> so, so I stopped the car and I felt the Lord inviting me into the worship center in Marshall. So I go into the worship center in Marshall and I was pacing up and down and up and down and up and down praying, just pouring out my soul to the Lord to the point that I felt the room, the, gl the glory of the Lord fill that room. My brother and my sister in Christ, God's alive and active and he met me in that room that day in such a way that I fell. Our, our, our church is, has a middle row. I fell right in the middle of the row, right there on my hands and knees and the glory of the Lord was so thick and so heavy in there. My toes began to crinkle. Why? Because I recognized I was an unholy man in the presence of a holy God. God, and God began to break me. Why do I do what I do? I could take you back to just this past Wednesday morning. I was at the altar, five o'clock in the morning. I'm at the church at weird times too, I guess. I was at the church, five o'clock, just this past Wednesday morning. I go to start sermon right, and I felt the Lord say, no, my child, come spend time with me before you start writing a message for my children. So I go to the altar, and there I am, laying, just like a child, for 45 minutes. I used the, my Bible as a pillow, and I couldn't tell you, I experienced, as the scriptures say, this pay, the peace that surpasses all understanding. Why do I do what I do? My brother, my sister, I'm just an ordinary man that's been touched by Jesus Christ. And I can relate with Joel, I can relate. I can relate. I can relate when Job says, I want you, then my very next breath, I can relate. I've been touched by Jesus in such a way, and I pray that you experience this touching of Jesus when he moves on your heart and moves on your mind in such a way that like our early Christian brother and sisters, they're willing to absolutely throw everything else aside. I've learned in my life, keep everything else away from me. I just want Jesus. I want him because I know without him, I'm leaving no impact in this world. I want him. 
And I'm learning. You see, I'm learning. I'm learning that unordinary starts when ordinary people meet a very supernatural God. You see, because we can tell. We can tell if you've met with Jesus. I sure can, I know. I can tell when I have conversations with people if they've truly met with Jesus Christ. Because here's the truth. Your actions show where your devotions go. Your actions show where your devotions go. Here's what I mean. There's not a person in this room that needs to go tell my two kids, two years old and 10 months old, I'm busy. Nobody needs to go tell them, hey, you need to spend time with dad. They know they need to spend time with dad. Why? Because dad feeds them. Mom does too, but just for the sake of this sermon. They know that dad feeds them. They need me. They're two years old and 10 months old. Now, somebody with teenage kids are about to say, enjoy it while you can. Yes, I know. They need me. Nobody needs to tell my kids, you need to spend time with God. Listen to me, brother and sister. I know we don't know each other all too well, but can I just shoot you straight here? Nobody needs to tell you to go spend time with Jesus. You should know that you need to spend time with dad. The early Christians, you see that, right? You see it. They were so cut to the heart. They were so moved. They had such an experience with Jesus Christ. They had such an experience that the very next thing they do, they knew nothing else to do. Nobody needed to motivate them. Nobody needed to tell them. They had such an experience with Jesus Christ that in turn they were willing to devote, throw it all away, give it all up, self-sacrifice, say no to everything that pleases them because they wanted more of Jesus. And nobody needed to motivate them to do that. And if we were to see them on the outside, we would say, my, my goodness, we can tell just by the way that you live your life that you've had an experience with Jesus Christ because I see you're willing to go all in with them. You see that? Your actions show where your devotions go. It's the same reason. When I got married, I gave myself to my wife, right? I gave it all to her, and now I care about the things that she cares about, even if that leads me into Kohl's and TJ Maxx for two hours. I'm doing it because I'm devoted. And I don't care where Jesus Christ leads me. I'm walking with him. I'm devoted. Just an ordinary man, just an ordinary man, just an ordinary woman, seeking to be used by a supernatural God to do unordinary things, to leave an impact that ordinary lives only wish that they could. I want to be unordinary. Do you want to be unordinary? It all starts with your devotion, but I could stand up here over and over again and say, devote yourself, devote yourself, devote yourself. But the truth of the matter is what you really need is to get onto your knees, whether it be in your bedroom or in your living room or pull your car over or come into the church, whatever it is. What you really need is to say no to yourself one time and say yes to Jesus Christ and ask him to touch your heart the same way he's touched mine. Ask him to touch your heart the same way God touched Abraham's heart. Ask him to touch your heart the same way he touched Moses' heart. Ask him to touch your heart the same way that he touched Isaiah. Ask him to touch your heart the same way that he touched Jonah. Ask him to touch your heart the same way he touched the disciples. Why? Because if you have an experience with Christ, my friend, trust me, just trust me as a broken man up here. You're going to want nothing else in this world when you see the fullness of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Nothing. I want to live an unordinary life. I want to live an unordinary life, and I know you do too because we're all in here, and we're in the middle you're in the middle. I want you to stand with me really fast because I want to challenge you just for a second if you'd allow me. As we kick off this series, I just want to challenge you. Another photo is going to come up on the screen here. And as it comes up on the screen, there's your middle. 
there's your middle. And there's going to be a day, James says, we won't even know when it is because this life is but a vapor. One minute it's here and one minute it's gone. There's going to be a day, though. And I tell you this with love, that your family and your friends are going to be asked to give an account of your life. And if you're in church today and you think, oh, it's too late for me, I'm too gone in years, the impact that I had was the impact that I had, oh, my friend, you haven't truly met Jesus Christ then because he can change you with one touch. There's your middle. We're all in the middle. We're all in the middle, and today you can leave church and decide how you want to change your middle. Today you can leave church and you can, you can have a part to play in how people are going to give it an account of your life. On ordinary starts when the ordinary meets the supernatural. Now many people in here, you may say, I want to live an unordinary life. I do. I really do. And some of you are going to white knuckle it and you're going to go try to get a hold of your life. Listen to me and listen to me straight. I did that for many years. You know what I've learned? You need the help of Jesus Christ. You need his help. Every single waking moment of your life, you need his help to say no to yourself, to live an intentional life. And that's why every day I find myself praying, Lord, I need you. <laughs> I need you. I need you in my sitting and I need you in my standing. I need you when I'm alone and I need you when I'm with people. I need you in the morning and I need you in the afternoon. I need you in the evening. I need you when I'm with my wife and when I'm with my children. Why? Because I want people to see an, or an ordinary man that has met with Jesus Christ. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. We're about to sing a song. And today you can have that opportunity right here and right now just to start making that a daily prayer for your life. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. With every head bowed, I'm going to lead you in prayer and then we're just going to sing. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we ask you under the mighty name of Jesus Christ here and now for those that came into church and maybe have not experienced you in a way that has left them broken. Father, I pray that as they cry out to you, Lord, I need you, would you move in a mighty way. Father, use us, ordinary people, to leave an impact as we devote ourselves to you. Give it all up to you. Leave it all for you. Father, would you, would you touch us in such a way where we would, like Job, say, I want you more than the very breath of my lungs. So Jesus, here we are now crying, Lord, we need you. We need you. We need you. We need you. In Jesus' name, everybody said.